We did. Okay, good, 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 good. All right. In the paperback book, Why God Used D.L. Moody, we have covered the first three uh, attributes. Okay. It's like teaching school in here sometimes. <laughs> Do what? Oh, it kept... Okay. Uh, thank you for that. <laughs> We've covered the first, first three attributes observed by R.A. Torrey uh, about D.L. Moody. R.A. Torrey worked very closely with D.L. Moody. And the first one was that uh, R.A. Torrey, no, Torrey noted that D.L. Moody was a surrendered man, a surrendered man. And don't, you know, just don't take, don't, look, in this book here, we're, we're just getting the topics from the book. You know that. Um, but look, I don't know about you, but I want to know why God uses great people. I want to know. It's not a secret. It's not a secret. There's a reason why God uses great people. And that's why we're going over this. So when we say a surrendered man, don't just sit there and say, oh, yeah, well, I'm surrendered. What's the next one? No, don't be, don't be as flippant as that. Surrendered. Think about it. Jesus was fully surrendered to God the Father, right? Jesus said, I do not, I do not say anything that he does not tell me to say, and I don't do anything that he does not tell me to do. Now, can you say that? Can I say that? I can't. Right? I can't. And there's no human being that can say that. But uh, somebody once asked uh, or made a statement around D.L. Moody as he was a young man. He said the world has yet to something like this. The world has yet to see what God can do with a man fully surrendered to him. And D.L. Moody said in his mind, I'm going to be that man. Now, was he as surrendered as Jesus? No. No, no human has that ability. Because we have that nature. It's, it's always fighting us, always pulling at us. But I will have to say that D.L. Moody, according to Ari Torrey, about as lived up to that as anybody else. So, things like a surrendered man. Next, a man of prayer. Here again. You know, don't just think, well, well, I pray, so what's the next one? No. Um, have you ever been up at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning praying for something or somebody? You know, uh, God, uses, God uses people that are regular in their prayer, consistent in their prayer, and different in their prayer. Um. You know, the thing that I enjoy about being up in the morning early, early, and I mean like early, and, and this is not every day, but sometimes, sometimes, you know, when I can't sleep, sometimes I will get up and I'll pray. And uh, I'm reminded by somebody, some preacher somewhere said one time that when I get up and pray at, you know, like three o'clock in the morning because I can't sleep, he said, uh, I tell God, now you and I both know there may not be another person in Chesterfield County that's up right now praying. Or, or you know, or maybe there, there may not be anybody within the five surrounding counties or whatever it is. Um, so do we really pray? It's not just prayer like you think of prayer. Do we really pray? Uh, and then a deep and practical student of the Bible. Now, he was a preacher. And as I said um, the last time that we uh, that we that I spoke on this, I covered that topic. And so preachers are going to study. Yes, they're going to study. They're going to spend hours and hours and hours a week, and that's the truth. Uh, any preacher that's worth his salt is going to do that. Um, so, so I'm, I'm not saying that, that you should study like D.L. Moody, but do you study the Word of God? I met with one of our members this week. And they and I went to their house and met with them, and they they held up this big book, and it was a Strong's exhaustive concordance of Bible words, right? And it has every every word in it from the King James Bible has every single word in it and everywhere it's used. I taught on that. I mentioned that 
last fall when I was teaching on studying the Bible. Ray Young mentioned it on Sunday morning just a couple weeks ago here, about uh, Sunday night, about studying the Bible. And so I wanted to know, okay, so she had it there, and she said, um, you know, I ordered this uh, recently. And I said, well, where did you learn to order that? I was trying to figure out, you know, where she got it. She said, well, it was several months ago. And uh, <clears throat> somebody mentioned it. And uh, she said, so I finally thought I'll go ahead and get it. Now, that's a person <clears throat> that is interested in studying God's Word. You don't use a Strong's exhaustive concordance unless you are digging into God's Word. And then I showed this person an app that cuts right through all of that. And I said... You know, uh, if, if we ever end up again without Internet, which uh, we did the other day, didn't we? Last week, one day, for a certain portion of the day. Okay, I didn't know it. I, I wasn't on it and uh, until somebody told me. So if we lose that Internet again, it wouldn't shock me if we did, and it wouldn't shock me if it was a planned thing. But then we're going to need the books again. We're going to need these books. And I have a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. And, okay, so Bible study. You know, do, do you really, really dig and, 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 and mine? Do you mine for the gold? Do you, is the gold just sitting on top of the ground? Is there, please tell me if there is, because I'm going there after tonight's service. And I'm going to take a big bucket with me. And I'm going to hire a bunch of guys to carry it, because I understand it's heavy. Never held any. No, it's not. You have to dig for it, right? You have to dig for it. And, uh, and God has a lot of truth that is not laying on the surface. Reading the Bible at face value, uh, you can pick up a lot of things. You can. And it's good. But if you're going to get the, the deeper things, the, you're going to find them under the surface. And they're going to come through studying, studying the Bible. Okay, so... The first three that we covered was that uh, Ari Tori said D.L. Moody was a surrendered man, a man of prayer, and a, a, a man of, he had a deep and practical, uh, he was a deep and practical student of the Bible. Tonight, we're going to look briefly at humility. The fourth uh, a character trait there, humility. The word humble is found 53 times in the Bible. How do you think I know that? Did I read the whole Bible in this week? I didn't. Right, right. It was a strong concordance. It was, it was on the internet, but I looked up humble. Uh, the, the, word, the word humbling is not in the Bible. The word humility is not in the Bible. But the words humble, the word humble is, and the word, and the word humbled, uh, those two words are. And they are used 53 times in the Bible. And, and that word, uh, the definition of that is a lowliness of mind. A lowliness of mind, a deep sense of one's own unworthiness in the sight of God. Self-abasement. Uh, not self in your basement. How many people have a basement? I don't. Stick my hand down. Yeah, they're from California though. There's a lot of basements in Indiana. There's not a lot of basements around here. I don't know why that is. It's not important tonight anyway, is it? The water table, I'm sure, has something to do with it. Yeah. Uh, uh, penitence for sin. This is humility. And a submission to the divine will. Submission to the divine will. The first use of the word comes uh, uh, in, in Exodus chapter 10 and verse 3. The Bible says, And Moses and Aaron came, and came in unto Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people what? Go. Let my people go, that they may serve me. So the question of Pharaoh is, How long? What's it going to take uh, for you to humble yourself and let the people go? The first great humbling of God's people came in the wilderness... As they wandered for those 40 years, the Bible speaks of, and I don't have that reference here, and I'm not sure why I don't, just didn't write it down, I guess. But the Bible speaks of you know, them wandering for 40 years and them uh, uh, refusing to humble themselves before God. They had rejected His plan. It's what we talked about this morning. It's about the sermon this morning. They had rejected His plan for them, which was to go in and to possess the what? 
promised land, yes. And uh, were they supposed to go, were they supposed to, uh, uh, after, they, after the spies returned, were they supposed to debate it and, uh, and, and, and schedule meetings? And, and uh, of the, were they supposed to do that or were they supposed to go in at once? Go in at once. Go in at once. That's just reviewing the sermon a little bit this morning. And they didn't do that. And they, and they talked themselves out of it. They allowed ten men. I don't know if I said this this morning, but understand this, that God killed those ten men the next day. Sent a plague and killed them. The ones that discouraged the nation, he killed them straight off the bat. Uh, it's a, it is, look, God can be very terrifying if he really wants to be. And it's what I was trying to last week. I was trying to get that point across. And, uh, and, and this is, no, okay, I'm getting sidetracked. Forget that. Anyhow. Uh, we're talking about God's people being humbled. And God humbled his people at that time when he said, uh, remember, they said, we're not going across. And, and, uh, and then he killed the ten and he pronounced judgment on them. They got up the next day and they packed their bags and they put their suits on and, and they said, okay, God, we're ready to go. We've changed our minds. And God says, no, no, you're not. You're not going. That was a decision for yesterday. And you rejected me and you said, let's hire a captain. Let's, let's elect a captain that will take us back to Egypt, back to bondage again. And that reminds me of this, that God over here says, if you'll humble yourself and surrender to my will uh, with lowliness of mind, because you don't know, you don't know what I know. And God says, I know everything. And not only that, I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to go in front of you and I'm going to fight for you and I'm going to win these battles. But you're going to have to step out in faith and, do, and, 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 and follow. You're going to have to follow in humility. So you, you had that God and the land flows with milk and honey. It is, it is an exceeding uh, good land, which we compared this morning. To Genesis 15, 1, God says, I, Abraham, I am, I, me, I, I am, interesting words there, isn't it? I am, we, we hear those again in a conversation with who in the Bible? Can you remember? God says, he uses the word I am. Who else? He talked to Abraham and said, I am thy exceeding great reward. Who else did he say that he used the words I am with? Who remembers? Moses, yeah. Hey, who am I to say uh, sent, sent me? When I go back to, to lead the people out, he says, you tell them the I am has sent you. So the I am, I am thy exceeding great reward. And I, the I am, I have prepared a, an exceeding good land for you. That makes sense. That makes sense. When you belong to God and every believer belongs to God and... And you have surrendered to his will. You, you are humble. You're humble. You, you're surrendered. You're like, hey, whatever you say, I'm in. I don't care what it stands like or sounds like. Uh, you know, uh, I'm in and I'm going to do that. And, and I trust you because I know an exceeding great God is going to give to me exceeding great things. Those two go together. They go together. His heart, I mean, I don't know how anybody can miss that. But we do. We do. We often do. We know we have an exceeding great God, uh, but we're just not quite sure that he wants to lead me down this road to get to something exceedingly great down there that's for me and my benefit. And it's like, mm, I don't know. I, I just don't know. I don't know about that. And that's not humility. That's pride and that's arrogance. When we say, I hear what you're saying... But I don't, I don't know if I'm buying into it. That's arrogance. To say that to a God that says, no, this is my word. I'm giving you my word. I'm giving you my word. I'm going to take you in. And I'm going to fight the battles for you. And yet somehow, because of our sin nature, there are times when we just say, ah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know about that. Why do we do that? Frustrating. Frustrates me about me if I ever find myself questioning God that way. I get very frustrated with me. 
Here's what I see, though, in the God one day that says, come on, everybody, let's go. Let's go. I'll lead you. I'll fight the battles. And then the God the next day that says, no, it's too late. You're going to the wilderness. And every one of you that rejected me today that is an, an adult, you're going to die out there. And you're never going to see this. 1 Peter 5.5. 5. 1 Peter 5.5. 5, we see it here. Okay? Remember, we, we are always... We're all, uh, we are always making the statement that the New Testament and the Old Testament, look, they do this constantly. 1 Peter 5, 5, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. And there's the word humility. It is in the Bible. How I missed that. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. On one day, God says, come on, follow me, humble yourselves, trust me, surrender to me, because I know what I'm doing. Amen? God knows what he's doing, folks. One day he's saying, come on, let's go. And we're saying, no, I'm not going and digging our heels in and, and, and just doing everything to ignore his leading, doing everything to reject his leading. And then... And then, you know, and, and look, and, and don't think for a minute that the people, when they said, okay, what their backs are, we're ready to go today. Don't think that they were humbling themselves before God. They just saw what happened to some people over, you know, they heard the judgment, they saw the ten get killed, and then they just said, well, hey, we better go or he's going to kill us too. That's not the same. That's not the same as bowing down. Remember we talked about worship, that worship is surrender. That's what worship is. Worship is not this. You know, pra praising is this, oh God, walking out in the fields and in the, and in the woods and praising God and lifting your hands up and praise to God and thanking Him for, 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 uh, for bragging on Him for what He is and thanking Him for what He does in our lives. That's praise. Worship is this. Remember Satan said to Jesus, bow down and worship me. In other words, bow down and surrender to my will and I will do this for you. Worship is a surrender. These people, when they had their bags packed and said, I want to go now, they, weren't, they were not in a repentant state, bowing down and saying, oh God, forgive me, forgive us, for we have sinned. It was a, no, well, let's go. It, it just seemed logical now to them. Well, we better go. And, and it's not the same. So we see a, a God that gives grace to the humble, and then we see how God resists the proud. And when we are proud and arrogant, God resists us. What do you think about that? What do you think of that notion that God, there are times that we are arrogant and proud and God says, yeah, yeah, well, you know what? I just became your biggest problem. That's what it means for God to resist us. We think of God as God's loving and God's kind and, and God's, you know, hey, look, God is holy, and God is a judge, and God demands holiness from His children. And when we are arrogant and proud, that verse goes to us, I'm going to resist you. I'm going to resist you. And, and as, I, as I just said a second ago, God says, I just became your biggest problem because of your failure to bow down, to your failure to... See yourself in a lowly state and, and, and give me the platform. Give me the throne you know, of your heart. Now, humility is found in our treatment of Jesus and others. So I have a three-point a three outline here. It's very easy. How many of you know the joy acrostic? Acrostic, is that the right word? Acrostic? Uh, J stands for what? Well, actually, Jesus first, the word joy. Jesus first, O, others second, and yourself last. And we're, that's what we're going to use. There's no way in one sermon that we can totally exhaust the, 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 that doctrine of humility. And, and I'm going to use a very simple and a very easily to remember outline tonight. Jesus joy. Joy, Jesus first, other second, yourself last. 
Now, now I do want to alert you to this, that the word meek in the Bible also means humble. Meek means humble. No, uh, uh, Numbers 12, 3 says, now the servant, no, now, now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. What is he saying? Moses is the meekest man in the world. That's what God just said. He is more meek than any other man in, upon the earth. Moses was the meekest man. Now, was Moses a great man? Yes, he was a great leader. He was trained up and, and reared up uh, uh, in Egypt, uh, in Pharaoh's household. He had the greatest uh, educations. He knew what worldly fame was, what worldly riches were. He was trained as a, as a leader uh, uh, of, uh, of people, of soldiers and army and conflict. He was a leader. He was a very strong man. But after spending 40 years on the backside of the desert, God took that arrogance out of him. But he still, he still had the knowledge. He still was a strong individual. And yet, he was meek. So remember this, and this might be in the, the lesson somewhere else, or the sermon. But uh, meek does not mean weak. Don't think, well, if I'm meek, that means I'm weak. That's not what it means at all. Actually, meek means humble. It actually, when, when it's spoken of Moses here, it's saying that he has great power and great strength, but he, he humbles himself and he never uses it for himself. He uses it for the betterment of other people. That's what being meek means. You, you can command and you, you can be strong and you can be ter terrifying. It's God. God is meek. Because he, if he, if he wanted, he could squash us all right under his thumb tonight, right? He could take us right out. But he's meek. He has that ability, but he, he condescends to our low estate. And he wades. He's the, great, he's the great fisherman out on the deepest seas in the world. And he comes right up to shore, and he wades in the shallows with us. Remember how you used to play with your kids at the beach? And they'd really, they were too young. Maybe they're, you know, I don't know, what, honey, three, four, five years old, whatever. And they play in the shallows. And they really don't want, they're scared of the water. God comes right, that's us. That's us. And God comes right down and says, I'll play right here with you. I love this. I love this right here. He condescends because God is meek. Okay. Point number one. Our depth of hu humility is revealed in our attitude toward God. Our depth of humility is revealed in our first in our attitude toward God. Jesus first, other second, yourself last, right? Jesus, say it with me. Jesus, others, and yourself. All right, I want you to remember that. In our sermon this morning, we've, we've talked about this, and I've kind of reviewed enough of it there but uh, uh, here tonight. But Psalm 106, 24 through 26 says this, Yea, they despise the pleasant land. This is what the psalmist, the psalmist is talking about our topic this morning, about the Israelites refusing to go over. Yea, they despise the pleasant land. They believed not his word. But murmured in their tents, and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. Therefore he lifted up his hand against them. He lifted up his hand against them. And he said, as I said a minute ago, God says, now, you're, you, yeah, you know what? You don't have to worry about the giants. You don't have to worry about the great walled cities. You don't have to worry about the great people. Good news, right? Oh, it's great news. No, what you have to worry about now is me. Me. The Bible says he lifted up his hand against them to overthrow them in the wilderness. The word resisteth means to oppose or to stand against. And it's a very strong word. And when we reject the will of God, that's what we're doing. We are opposing His will. We, uh, we, we, we are resisting His will. 
the humble trust God and have confidence in his plan, knowing that his plans are perfect and always carried out, always carried out. What was the famous uh, sentence that Job uttered? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he slay me, that's a humble man. And think of all that Job went through. That's a humble man. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. We, 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 uh, our, our attitude toward God in his sovereignty, his goodness, and his presence. I'm going to read for you here. Psalm. Psalm 23. How many of you have ever heard of Psalm 23? It's probably the most famous psalm, right? Like the most famous verse is probably John 3.16. The most famous psalm is probably Psalm 23. And I, I think I have it memorized, but uh, you know how that goes with me sometimes. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Doesn't matter where I go, doesn't matter what I get into, I shall not want. He maketh me, the, now this is the humble person. This is a, this is a uh, psalm of a humble person thinking of God. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the, that's the psalm of a humble man. That's the psalm of a man that trusts God. And our humility, our humility, and the depth of our humility is going to be revealed in the trust that we have in God. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37 says, uh, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And this is the first and great commandment. And for the humble man, that's, and that's his meat and potatoes. Psalm 23, and I love you, and I trust you. Yes, I, I there are times when things look fearful. Because I, I am as a grasshopper sometimes compared to the powers that are in this world working. Uh, but I know, as we said this morning, but I know that when you're on my side, then they become the grasshoppers. And that you will give me victory. Point number two. So first one is uh, our, our attitude toward God and His sovereignty and, and His goodness and His presence. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, Jesus said. Point number two. Our depth of humility is revealed in our attitude toward others. The second part of Matthew 22 in verse 37 uh, and 39, uh, through 39, uh, it goes on to say, And the second, and this is the first and great commandment, And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It is first our, our treatment, our attitude toward God, and our, and our attitude toward His sovereignty, uh, you, toward His ability, His perfect ability to control everything. And then the second thing that reveals the depth of our humility is revealed in our attitude toward others. Toward others. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Can we rejoice in the successes of other people? Rick Bartley. How many people know Rick Bartley? Uh, remember my friend from Indiana that's been down a couple times? Okay, you would if you saw him. But somebody called him one morning, and uh, like 6 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, and they said, check your, check your side door. And he's like, what? They said, check your side door. He said, what are you talking about? Go to your side door and look out the side door. So he said, okay. He doesn't know who it was. So he does, and he goes out there. There's a bag there. And the bag is full of, uh, he opens it, looks in it, you know, make sure it's not a bomb. 
He looks and, and there's meat. There's hamburger, there's steaks. There's all this meat. Pounds and pounds and pounds of meat. So he picks it up and takes it in. And he found out later that day who it was. So he called his, he called a, a friend of his. Uh, no, he didn't call him. Later in the day, he shared this with a friend of his. And he said, you wouldn't believe the blessing this morning. I mean, this, go check your side door, you know, take through the whole thing. He says, and somebody gave me all this great meat. And he found out later that day who it was. And, uh, and this was his response of his friend. Well, go ahead and fill your veins full of cholesterol. Right? Do you struggle rejoicing with other people's successes? Because if you do, then your humility is not as deep as you think it is. You're, you're not a humble, we're not a humble person when we do that. When we can say, oh, praise God, that's awesome. Instead of, instead of immediately thinking, well, I don't understand why God doesn't do that for me. That's not a humble person. Because a humble, a humble person trusts God. And a humble person is able to rejoice. Because he trusts God, he's able to rejoice in the successes of other people. Humble people seek unity. They seek unity. In a church, humble people seek unity. Now, this church has a wonderful spirit, and, and, and it does. Has not always been that way. We know that, but it does now. And that's, and that's been a long time coming. And, and, and humble people say, oh, we're going to do whatever's necessary to keep unity. Now, I don't mean compromise. I don't mean that. I'm not going to compromise on, on the ways of God, the truth of God, the doctrine of God for unity's sake. I'm not doing that. But look, we all have the same Holy Spirit indwelling us. Correct? Right. So if we all yielded to the same Spirit, then there's going to be unity. You know, uh, uh, be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ, uh, even as, as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. It is forgiveness. It is understanding. It is understanding that she's not exactly like, like me, but as long as we're focused on the truth of God and what God's trying to do in this church and what God's trying to do in this world, and we are surrendered to the Holy Spirit, we're going to find unity. And, 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 you know, hey, this guy back here may do something that irritates me. But we're going, to, we're going to set that aside, and we're going to look for the common ground. And the common ground will always be right here. This, this Bible right here has, is tru has, contains truth. And it's not your truth and my truth. I don't read a passage and say, well, I get this out of it. And you read the same passage and say, well, that's really neat, but this is what I get out of it. I don't think, I don't think it's what you're saying it is. But if that's what you get out of it, then good for you. This is what I think it is. The Bible is of no private interpretation. It means one thing. And if we are asking the Holy Spirit to teach us what the Bible says, then we're all going to be on the same page. Where we get off. Uh, where we get off, you know, off the page one from another is when, we, is when we do not know the Scripture, when we do not care about the things of God, when we do not care about the work that God's doing in this world, which is saving people. That's what He's doing. That's what he's doing, saving people. And we're not connected to that work somehow. We're going to struggle. The, uh, humble people seek to edify other people. Seek to edify other people. They seek to lift people up. They seek to, uh, to, to impart. Had a guy call me yesterday, one of my friends from college. And we talked for about 45 minutes. And he said some very encouraging things to me and I told him I said you know what Mike that really encourages me and I said I'm, I'm very thankful for the phone call he said well I mean it, it is you know it is what it is and I said well that's extremely encouraging and I appreciate you saying that to me you know uh, here we are in our 60s now and I know that's not really old to some people but you know what's a whole lot older than I was when I was in my 20s right it's a lot older than when I was in my 20s and now he and I are in our 60s, we, we became friends at college, we still have that relationship. And he lifted my spirit yesterday. Now, I, wasn't, I didn't have a bad spirit. I was doing fine. But he lifted, he edified, he, 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 uh, he, was the, he, he was some wind in my sails yesterday. And that's what humble people do. 
Everybody else is sitting around going, I don't understand why somebody doesn't blow into my sail. Well, that's probably why. You just answered your own question. You know, you're about you. Sometimes we get about us. And, and, and we're not thinking anymore about what, what does she need? And what does he need? And what are her needs? And what's his need? And that we, we become oblivious to that. And, we and what we focus on is me. Me. Now, I don't understand. Nobody's encouraging me. And uh, you know, nobody's doing for me. And they never will. The more we say me, 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 the more God says, you need to be careful because I resist that attitude right there. Number three. So number one is the, our depth of humility is revealed in our attitude toward God. Joy. Jesus first. Uh, number two is our depth of humility is revealed in our attitude toward others. This is the O in joy. Others second. Jesus first, others second. And then ourselves last. Je uh, yourself last. Our depth of humility is revealed in our attitude towards self. Someone once said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Do you get that? I had to read it like five times before I got it. It's not thinking less of who you are, because you know what? In the sight of God, you, you are extremely valuable. You're the apple of his eye. And he seeks an intimate relationship with you. With you. You have great value in the sight of God. So it's not thinking that I'm just a, you know, I'm just a scumbag. I'm not worth anything and I can't do anything. And that's not humility. If anything, that's more focused on yourself. It's not humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. In other words, you just don't think those thoughts. They're few and far between. You just don't think about you because you're, I hate to be redundant. And actually, I don't hate to be redundant. I'm not even sure why I said that. Uh, repetition is the key to learning. The more you say, I don't understand why I... The more you say that, the more it is revealed that, that you're not as humble as you think you are. And the more that you get wrapped up in somebody else's life. You know, I know Gene a little bit. You know, Gene's been with us now for a couple months. And, 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 and I, and I, but I'm learning Gene. And I'm learning Gene and I'm learning what her needs are. You know, those, that doesn't just happen. But I'm learning Jean and, and Beverly. I know Beverly, you know, uh, not as well as, as I could. And I could go through every person in this room and I could say, I know you just on some level. I know you and I know what your needs are. I know what your weaknesses are. Uh, uh, at least I have a good idea of these things because we've been together now for how many years? Six years. And so I'm really starting to hit um, uh, my stride, I think, as a pastor, knowing the people. When you're around people for six years, you really begin to know. And, and I desire to do that because I want to know the areas where they need help, the areas where they struggle. Because I, as a pastor, as a shepherd, I want to come in and I want to give that to you. I want to get behind you and I want to, I want to blow in your sails. I, I want to see you move forward. I want to see you grow, uh, grow you know, mature in, 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 uh, in Christ Jesus. Well, if I know you and, and if I know you and if I know that couple back there, if I know her and him and them and, okay, if I know that as a pastor, and if I'm caring for the needs of our people, there's not a lot of time for me. And I am not saying, folks, I am not saying that I am the picture of humility. I'm not saying that because I have my struggles just like you do. But I am saying this, and it's proven. I have pro I've proved it to me that the more that you care and involve yourself in the lives of others, the less time there is for yourself. 
And by the, just by the very nature that you're committed to helping other people means that you, j just the nature of that philosophy, that principle, puts yourself at the bottom. And that's exactly where God wants you and wants us. Jesus first, others second, and ourselves last. Yourself last. Humility. Humble people are thankful people. They're thankful people. Humble people are not wise in their own eyes. Uh, I was talking with Caleb this morning about this. And uh, about like self-recognition. Uh, not, that's not right. Self-awareness. Self-awareness. You know. And I told Caleb, I said, I, Caleb, I think guys like you and me, we look in the mirror and we see the dirt on us. It's like, uh, you know, man, you're dirty. When a lot of people look in the mirror and go, hey, good morning. What well, I'm talking about, I like that guy. You know, you know the difference? And then there are people that look in the mirror and, and, and say, oh. You're sorry, Lot. You're pitiful. Being, being too self-aware can be destructive. Uh, but walking that balance there and allowing God, the Word of God, to, to point out your deficiencies, that's a healthy thing. And it's a healthy thing to be able to look in a mirror and say, boy, you need work on that area. And... Uh, you know, and over here, you need work there too, rather than you looking in the mirror and seeing this beautifully, this handsome person, and, and you just love being in that body with them. That's not what we're looking for. Humble people are forgiving people. Forgiving people. Humble people are teachable people. Teachable people. Humble people are, have a servant's heart. As did Jesus. And as his uh, example was for us. Perfect. So three things. The word is joy. Joy. Jesus first. Others second. Yourself last. When you have that priority uh, in your life. And that priority uh, directs. It directs your life. That's the life of a humble person. Not saying that that, I, that I'm all there. I'm not saying that any of us are. But that's the goal. I press toward that mark right there. That's who I want to be. And even when I fail, I think even when we fail, th those that have that priority, when we fail, God says, I, I know you failed, but I know in your hearts that you really wanted to do the right thing. I know you did because I know your heart. And uh, just get up, get up. Let me brush you off. Let's hit. Let's keep going. Joy. Jesus first, others second, yourself last. That across the right there will help you, uh, help you and I uh, understand and be, and be very aware of our level of humility. Do we not all want to hear, and I'm going to say this and be done. God the, God the Father said on several occasions, I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think four times he said this in the New Testament about Jesus. This is my beloved son in whom I am well. Is that not what you want to hear? Is that not? Isn't that all we want to hear? When my dad would, would, would and, and, and praise from my dad was few and far between. It, it's just... It's just him. It doesn't make him bad. It's just, it's just him. Uh, it's, you know, old mountain man from mountains of Virginia. It just wasn't there. Okay. But yet I did know. I, I, I sensed. I could sense when he was pleased. Well, I could sense when he was not pleased. I know that. I could feel that. But you know what I'm saying? Um, and, and, and I lived for that. As an unsaved person, I lived for my dad's recognition. I lived for my dad to say, good game today. You know, I played football. Good game today. I, I told you, I lived for my, I won't do it again, I promise you. But I lived to hear my dad whistle from the stands before a game started. He normally missed our games because he was a truck driver. 
and we played on Friday nights, and he rarely got back, but the times he did, he would whistle, as I did in here the other night. And, uh, and man, I look. I was just like a dog. He treated us just like dogs. We were trained. He'd whistle, and we'd look. And I mean that in a good way. He'd whistle, we'd look. I heard the whistle, I looked, and my dad, he wouldn't, hey, Mark. That was not my dad. That would have been my mom. No, my dad would just, he'd stand up and he'd whistle. And then we, and then I would look. He did the same with my brother, but I would look and he would just stand. He would just stand there. He didn't wave. And I didn't wave back. I just looked at him. And then right, even tonight, even tonight, I get chills thinking about that. Well, Remember when Jesus, uh, when Stephen was being stoned, and Stephen looked up, and the clouds parted, and he saw who? Jesus. And he saw Jesus doing what? Standing up. Jesus wasn't sitting there like, hang in there. You'll be all right. I'll see you in a little bit. Got somebody else to talk to now. Jesus was standing up. Jesus today is sitting at the right hand of God. Jesus was standing up looking at him like, yeah. Bible didn't say he was clapping, but that's that's what I got to feel. That's what I, that's what I had to imagine that Stephen was feeling was that Jesus is standing up and it's like, I got this. I am on this. Every detail, every rock, every stone, every bit of pain, every bit of energy that's leaving your body. Your life is actually spilling out of your body right now. And I'm watching and I am pleased. And I am pleased. I just want to hear that. I want to hear that. I don't want to hear, man, here comes Mark Crock. And he wouldn't say this anyway. But, you know, uh, uh, no. I just want to hear, well done. That's all I want to hear. Well done. And we will have done well, uh, uh, partly, in, in, in respect to our humility. D.L. Moody was a humble man. You read that book, Ari Torrey spends a few pages on it, and he tells you about why he was. He just preferred everybody else over himself, in honor preferring one another. And that's what I want. I want to be surrendered. I want to be a man of prayer. I want to be a student of the Bible. And I want to be humbled through the grace of God. We're not going to accomplish it in our own spirit. Not going to happen. Ever. Ever. But it will happen through Holy Spirit, His power, His grace. Let's pray. Of all the, of all the, of, of the first four uh, topics that we have spoken on about the life of D.L. Moody, this one to me is, is harder. I mean, I can, I can think about surrender more easily than I, can take, than I can think of being humble. I can think of prayer more easily than I can think of being humble. I can think of being a student of the Word of God more easily and, and, and attainable than humility. Because every, every, every cell in our body is tainted with sin. And at the very root of that sin is pride. And it so raises its head, uh, its ugly, ugly head in our lives far too often than it should. And in my life too. God help us. God, help us. Help us to depend on you. Help us to depend on your grace, your power. You giving us the right desires in our life. Help us to be led by the Holy Spirit. Help us to think of you first, others second, and ourselves last. I suspicion this might be the hardest one of all of these topics that, we'll, that we have preached and that we will preach. This could very well be the hardest one for us. God help us. We're here tonight. That shows a level of 
humility right there in our people's uh, uh, life is the fact that they're back tonight. Thankful for that. I'm encouraged by that. But that's not, that's not where it, 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 it doesn't end there. A yieldedness to your spirit, your power, and a, and a love for you and a love for others will automatically put us last. And that's what we want. And that's what we need. God help us to that end. Bless our people now as they travel home tonight. Uh, deliver them safely home. And, and may, we, may, our, may our candles shine bright uh, throughout this week as we live for you. And uh, as we are that testimony of your love and, uh, and your desires uh, toward man. May people see that in us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.